First and foremost, I ask that all of the bishops who are here, I'm going to do it this way if it's all right with everybody. Yes, sir. All of the bishops that are here, I ask that they would stand because they didn't have to be here all this morning. I appreciate all the bishops. I just ask you to stand. I'm going to give all of these bishops a hand. Come on, man. Give them a hand. First and foremost, I want to thank God for General Board Member J. Drew Shear being in the house. Yeah. Appreciate him very much. Bishop J. Uh, excuse me, J. Harley Lowes Jr. Come on, let's hear it for him. General Secretary. serving under Bishop Lowes, and I appreciate the opportunity that he has given to me in the office of the General Secretary. <coughs> I want to thank the Lord for Bishop Frank Anderson, Jr., my jurisdiction. <laughs> I couldn't serve the adjutancy if it had not been for him giving me permission to do so, and I appreciate him Amen. very much. I want to thank the Lord for this person who is here on today, the chairman of the AIM Convention. Come on, let's hear it. I want to thank God also. There is a, a gentleman who is here who has served the agency for many years, and I want you to give him a warm round of applause. Bishop Clarence Lewis III. I want you to give him a hand. Jones, and uh, he served as our Deputy Adjutant General for many years, and I appreciate his presence on today. And then let me, let me do this. The former Adjutant General of this great church, currently the member of the General Board, I appreciate him very much. Yes. Ten years ago, he gave me an opportunity to serve as scribe, 
And I really didn't know exactly what all of that meant. But uh, I later found out what he was what he was doing, pushing and supporting me. And I appreciate that. Bishop, I'm gonna appreciate you very much. Now, let me do this. I want to introduce the team, and then I'm gonna introduce a couple of family members, and I promise you I won't be long. Brothers and sisters, I want uh, Deputy Adjutant General Bishop Augustus Pullen, if he would stand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Deputy Adjutant General Overseer Harold Reed. Come on, let's hear it for him. Yes. Scribe of the National Adjutancy, Overseer Earl Matthews. Yes. We know that Mother Simmons is. She, she is there right now for her daughter, Sharon. Oh, excuse me. What did I say? Yes. Mother Simmons. I'm, I am so sorry. Mother Miller. She is there for her daughter, Sharon. And uh, Sharon is dealing with some physical challenges right now. But God is going to bless her. Yes. So come on, let's hear it for Mother Miller. Deputy Adjutant Mother, Mother Doreen Simmons, Montague Simmons, Mother Doreen Montague Simmons. Or excuse me, Deputy Adjutant Mother, Deputy Adjutant Mother, Mother Connie M. Smith. The Dean of the Academy, Overseer Guy Glenn. The Assistant Dean of the Academy, Dr. Marifa Fields. I want the chief overseer to stand. Come on, let's hear it for Dr. Hatcher. And all of the overseers and adjutant mothers, I want you to stand. Come on, let's give them a hand. Now, I really got to thank these people. Elder Eugene McCowan, Overseer McCowan, and also every person that served in registration in any way, I want them to stand. Thank you very much. Now, I want to thank God. My wife and I, we don't have any children. But she says that her son, we say that her, her excuse me, her brother is our son. And uh, my niece is our daughter. And my niece is here all the way from Detroit. Come on, yeah, you gotta stand, baby. Yeah. Yeah, is here. I appreciate her very much. And brothers and sisters, you got to understand, I wouldn't be Robert Rudolph. I will not be wrong. Yes, I will not for that one. Right. I will I'm with my wife because I love her. And, and I want to say this, because y'all know I'm a little slow. I'm a little slow. But uh, my wife, and I'm going to brag just a little bit, I'm going to the word, I Go promise ahead. you I am. Ahead, my wife has been in love with me since she was 14 years old. <laughs> Chapter the 11th through the 14th verses. 
The word of the Lord says, And it came to pass, when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified and did not then wait by course. Right. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, and Jonathan, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar. Wow. And with them a hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets. And it came to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound, to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Somebody help me say, for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. That then the house was filled with a cloud. Even the house of the Lord. So that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Help me say, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. For the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about a glorious order. Yes, would you help me and say it with me? A glorious, a glorious order. order. I was born in Chicago. My parents met and got married in Chicago, but I was raised in the rural deep south. And one of the things that I had to learn rather quickly is that in the Pentecostal church, the church that I grew up in, the sanctified church, it was a little different than the other churches that my cousins worshipped. They really dealt with a lot of things concerning order and worship and certain styles. And I began to say to myself that I know that we're sanctified. I know that we are Holy Ghost filled. Yes. And I don't ever want to stop or to go against the foundation of my church. Yes. No matter what achievements I have accomplished, no matter what has been done in my life, whether it's been in the secular or in the religious realm, I never forget that I am saved, I am sanctified, and I'm Holy Ghost filled. And one of the things that I learned growing up is that we had a little sanctified church. And a lot of times the people would make fun of us because we were in church all day. A lot of times they would make fun of us because we had to be in church all night long in many cases. We couldn't do a lot of the things that a lot of people could do. All because of something that we call legalism within our churches. Because people believed that there were certain things that you had to do in order to be saved and certain things that you could not do in order to allow the Spirit of God to be on the inside of you. Right. Protocol has been somewhat taboo, a taboo word in many circles, specifically in the Pentecostal persuasion. Within, I would say, the last 20 years or so, many Pentecostals have recognized the need to sit at the table of protocol. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have finally been able to really embrace litany and lit liturgy in the church. But most importantly, most importantly, we realize that just because we have protocol All right. does not mean that we have to stop praising God. Yes, sir. 
And one of the things that we also realize is just because we do things with a sense of order, just because we do things because we have a bit of dignity added to the sanctification on the inside of us, it does not mean that we cannot praise God like we've lost our minds. I'm, I want you to understand very plainly and very succinctly that we are Holy Ghost filled people. Yeah. Yeah. No matter how much we learn about protocol, no matter how much we learn about order, no matter how much we learn about doing things a certain way, please never forget that you have the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. And sometimes you have to take the program and you have to basically cut it up and tear it up and let the Lord have his way. I'm here to tell you that this is wonderful what we're doing. I thank God for protocol. I thank God for order. I thank God for worship. But please understand that you cannot have the glory without a certain order. It has to be a certain order. Well, let me tell you what that order is. And uh, you must understand that the order has to be done specifically. All right. One of the things that I'm concerned about adjuvants, I am so concerned about the fact that we are more concerned yeah. about status. Yeah. Yes, we are more concerned about position. Right. We are more concerned about being seen. That's it. That's it instead of actually doing the job. What we fail to realize is just because we have a cord or a pen, it's not the most important thing in the world. I appreciate your support, and I thank God for the agency, how we recognize certain people who are overseers, and how we recognize certain people who are national agents. But brothers and sisters, don't get it twisted. Because what you must understand is that although we have a code, although we have a pen, although, brother bishops, we have a chain, we must understand that if God is not in our lives, if God is not in our lives, we won't be able to do the will of God. Let me tell you why I'm so concerned. Let, let me tell you why I'm so concerned. Because I, we, 10 years, for 10 years, I've gone to 200 and 25 funerals oh of jurisdictional bishops. Wow. 225. Wow. And for the sake of getting in trouble, for the sake of getting in trouble, I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but it's very interesting. It's very interesting how when a bishop goes on to be with the Lord, uh -huh. we can be saved while the bishop is still the jurisdictional prelate. We can be sanctified as long as the bishop is still the jurisdictional prelate. We can be Holy Ghost filled as long as the bishop is the jurisdictional prelate. But it seems to me that we close our eyes, when the bishop closes his eyes, we start backsliding. Because the most important thing at that point to many people is who is going to be the next person in line to be the bishop. Well, I want to tell you something that really bothered me. It really, it really bothered me because y'all told me that you had to be saved. That, that's what y'all told me. You told me that you had to be sanctified. You told me that you had to be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what you told me. But the, but the demeanor that I'm seeing during this particular period of time, but the actions that I'm seeing during this particular time, it, it, it's not saintly. It's, it's not saintly. It's not saintly. It seems like we'll do anything in order to get a change. It seems like we'll do anything in order to get a position. It seems like we'll do anything in order to be recognized.
But what we fail to realize is that the most important position is that position of being a servant. I'm here to tell you that when we die and when we go on to heaven, I'm going to tell you that when we meet him, God's not going to ask you if you are a bishop. No, he's not going to ask you if you're a bishop. He's not going to ask you if you are a missionary. He's not going to ask you if you have a position or do you have a cord or do you wear a chain or do you have a habit or do you have some vestments. He's going to want to know, did you feed the homeless? Did you clothe the naked? national agency. We are concerned about position. We are concerned about status. But what about just being saved? Tell somebody I'm going to be saved. Make me backslide. I promise you, I'm giving up right now because I'm going to be saved. I thank God for being a bishop in our church, but if this chain is going to make me backslide, I promise you, I'll give it back. If those baskets will make me backslide, I promise you, I'll give it back because I want to be saved. but I want to be saved. I know I'm a son of the church, but I want to be saved. I want to be saved. I want to do what's right. How many out there want to be saved? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I want to be saved. And in order for glory to come, you gotta have some saved folk in the house. Sisters, there are some things that you just can't do. Not because you're a member of the Church of God in Christ, but there are just some things you ought not do because you are sanctified. You set yourself apart. You gave your life to the Lord. You ought to be sanctified. You ought to be set apart. Preachers, we can't do what other preachers do. We gotta be saved and sanctified. We gotta be saved and sanctified. We shouldn't have to hear about this, that, and the other. We've got to be saved and sanctified. As it is, you have got to be sanctified. You've got to be set apart. I want to tell you. For the glorious order to come, you've got to be saved. Help me say saved. For the glorious order to come, you've got to be sanctified. Help me say sanctified. And for the glorious order to come, you have got to have the Holy Spirit. And y'all sit down on this one because I, I, I got to deal with this. Yes, sir. I told you I grew up in the rural south. 
And before, literally before, I could play the drums when I was five years old. Come on. All right now. Come on. Before I could play the drums, I got on the drums one day. And there was a church mother there. And she came to me. She said, baby. I'm serious, y'all. I'm very serious. Baby, are you are you saved? <laughs> Didn't really understand what you were saying. And, and Mother Johnson, Mother Olive B. Johnson, oh, yes. she escorted me off the drums. <laughs> Literally escorted me off the drums. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I got so I got saved so early because I want to play the drums. I didn't know what <laughs> I got saved, y'all. I really got saved. Yes, I asked the Lord to forgive me of my sins, and I got right back on the drum. <laughs> and I'm gonna lie, I'm gonna be real with you. And when I got back on the drums, this time, Mother Olive Johnson and Mother Ruthie Davis came to me. And they said, baby, I'm telling y'all the truth. I'm telling y'all the truth. You got saved? You got saved? Yes, ma'am, I got saved. I came on beating the drums. They said, baby, you, you got the Holy Ghost yet? I'm like, now, wait a minute, buddy. Come back and be saved. Now, let me get on. Leave me alone. You know what I'm saying? And both of them kindly extorted me off. I'm talking about in the middle of service, y'all. I was so embarrassed, I was so hurt. But I not only got saved again, because I hadn't been saved again, but I got filled with the Holy Ghost. And I wasn't playing, y'all, because what happened to me is I began to feel God's presence on the inside. And I began to speak in tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance. And I'm so glad that Mama Johnson made me get off the drums. I'm so glad that Mama Ruthie made me get off the drums. Because they wanted to make sure in that small town, in that small church, that I was saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, now here's where I have a problem with most of us in the Church of God in Christ. Is that a lot of times, we never have a record. We started preaching at a certain age. We started participating in the church at a certain age. We started doing things. We started shouting at a certain age. We, we started doing things in the church at a certain age. We're, we're church kids. We grew up in the Sunshine Band. We grew up in YPWW. Yes, sir. And there never was a record of us ever coming and receiving the Lord as our personal Savior. There never was a record of us receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There never was a record of anybody hearing you speak in any kind of tongues. There never was a record of you feeling God's spirit. You just helped somebody. And that bothers me. Because we place emphasis upon position. We place emphasis upon status. And the problem is that most people go through their lives in the church and because they sound like a preacher. Because your daddy was a preacher. Or because you're next in line, you, they give you a license to ministry. And then you, you, it's about time you ought to become an elder so they ordain you to become an elder. The problem and the danger with that, brothers and sisters, is at some point, you're going to have some people who are ministers and elders and superintendents and administrative assistants, and I'm not going to go any further, who do not have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm concerned about that. Because if this is a Pentecostal church, if this is a holiness church, if we want a glorious order, we need to be saved 